Hey there, this is Tom, and this is day 82 of 100 Days of Making Minis. And as has kind of become my tradition, I decided to uh, have some fun making some, uh, putting some models together. So these are some more figures from the Death Watch Overkill set. Some Gene Sealer Cult, this is Gene Sealer, and some uh, Gene Sealer Cult hybrids. Um, I don't remember what level these are, these are pretty advanced ones. Um, I like these guys a lot. They are some of the coolest figures that I think GW's put out in a while. They've done a lot recently, but um, I don't know. I just love their take on these, especially because they used to have them back when I very first started 40K, and then when it kind of went away and everything became all about Tyranids, um, I don't know, it was a little bit of a bummer. So I really like to see, though, how they've kind of reimagined it all and put together. All right, well, now uh, let's get on to some questions. All right, this first set of questions comes from the Miniatures Paintbrush. And I wanna say this real quick, um, just uh, thank you for your patience because this technically was asked a while ago but it got lost in the spam filter. Uh, but then when I found it, I thought, oh, this will be great for the Q&A. So here we go, first question is, how would you create tombstones? It's for my Age of Sigmar Death Army bases and I need them to scale. Start with a box. What would the armature look like? Well, for a tombstone or anything like that, I would start by sculpting the the generic tombstone shape. And I would do that by, by laying uh, it flat down on a hard surface. Uh, for instance, like I like to use my, uh, tiles a lot. Um, but if you needed something more flexible to pop it off easier, uh, you could put it on a plastic bag. But anyways, you spread out your material to the thickness you want and then trim it down and after that you sand it to shape so for instance say you're doing kind of a really typical tombstone where it's a rectangle shape but the top is like a half circle well you 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 kind of roughly shape it to that just to save yourself some time and then when it's all cured and i would suggest using a mix of green stuff and aves something that will make the putty nice and hard and easy to file you pop it off file it down boom you have a tombstone and if you want to make it look more decorative um, or chipped or whatever, well then you can either, you can just chisel away at that, make little marks and slashes, or you can spread a thin layer of green stuff on top of that and cut in the details, sculpt them in just like you would anything else. Um, if you wanted to use Fimo, it might be a little trickier just because it will be softer for longer, but you would pretty much do it the same way. Lay it down flat somewhere, sculpt it all on, and um, the only trick then would be how to put the details on the back. But again, I'd probably do that by um, either adding another layer of Fimo after it was baked and putting some green stuff down, then some Fimo and sculpting the other side, or just um, use green stuff. All right, so the second question says he's, I have ordered rolling pins from Green Stuff World, and what would be the best material to create bases? with Aves, Green Stuff, Milliput, Procreate, any mixture of these above. Um, I would recommend, uh, if, especially if you're doing talking about doing an entire base and not just um, a layer on top, I would use Green Stuff and Aves, you know, about a 50-50 mix, uh, or Procreate and Aves, if that's what you have. You'll basically get the same result. But the key is, is that by adding in the Aves, it'll get a little more rigid, um, and, and you can fine tune it with filing if necessary. All right, the last question is, as, oh, I'm a YouTuber. If you have time, could you check out my channel and tell me what you think? Yes, I will. I am sorry I haven't been able to yet, but I will check it out and let you know what I think. All right, this next question comes from, I believe someone in Russia, but I can't pronounce, I, I don't know how to read that. So sorry, I can't read your name, but hopefully you'll recognize it and uh, hopefully you'll catch this. So, hey Tom, how much did you pay for Sir Frog Guy's 3D print? Uh, the low res print that I did of Sir Frog's worth, as you can see here, I went ended up spraying him to give him a, uh, make him photograph a little, little better. Uh, this is a 25 micron print that came off of a Form 2, and it only cost me about 20 bucks, and that's with shipping. Um, you, the final print will be a little higher res, um, or, or a lot higher res, I don't know. But this is really good. Like, I was very surprised. You can see, you probably can't on the camera here, but you can see a little striation right in there, but it's very impressive at how good of a print you can get for such a cheap price. 
This next question is from Zach Hoskins. I have a question on what is the easiest, in your opinion, way to make very precise bevels on clothes, armor, for miniatures. A good example of what I'm talking about would be Sinzreth Blood Vestal High Priestess miniature by Raging Heroes. Those boots she has looks extremely complicated. I'm unsure if how that would be done with traditional techniques. And my guess is that it was probably sculpted in ZBrush and then 3D printed on an SLA printer. If one was to attempt something like that traditionally, would you recommend trying to form it with unbaked clay alone or rather bake something close to that and then file sand the armor once it has been baked since the clay can't be accidentally nudged out of place. I can see issues with both approaches, but was just curious with, uh, oh, sorry, curious how you'd attempt to go about such a task. Okay, well, first of all, I have not seen this figure, uh, or well, I might have seen it, but I'm not aware of the name. But I am familiar with Raging Heroes, and I am almost positive this is a, would be a ZBrush um, digital sculpt. Uh, that, I believe that's how all of their sculpts are done. So, yeah, there's a good chance that with some of the detail, it, it's going to be it could be very easy to, to, I don't mean this in a bad way, but to overdo it, you know, to put a ton in and not really have it be a consideration. So, uh, but as far as your question with clothes, armor, and, and doing bevels, I like to try and do as much as I can uh, with the unbaked or uncured uh, material um, and just try and gently form that. I, a lot of times we'll use, a, we'll use the flat chisel clay shaper because that lets you, it's got a nice flat edge, but it's also a little soft and subtle so you won't get um, weird dimples that can happen sometimes if you're pressed too hard with a metal tool. Um, but with that said, if you're gonna be working on a piece that's going to be sticking out a little too far um, from the armature, like what would be an example, well, a, fl a flying cloak or a piece of armor, maybe on the shoulders that, that just kind of juts out, that can be really hard to do with a free form uh, flowing piece, uh, free standing kind of element of clay or putty. And in that case, yes, I would let it cure or let it bake and then go back in and either file it down or maybe add some material on to where you're basically making the bevel after it's baked. But, but now that the clay or the putty is cured, you, you're essentially the, the material, you have, you have much more of an understructure to build the bevel and other details off of. So I hope that helps. Um, if you, if you need, yeah, you can leave another comment if, if I didn't quite get what you were talking about there. Okay, this next question is from Can't Barrage the Farage. Farage, I don't know. <laughs> what was your first ever commission mini? This could be by a friend or a random person, doesn't have to be a company. Well, my very first commission piece was actually for a company. Um, it was for Fantasy West was the name of the company for a guy named Troy Megley um, and it was a really interesting piece and way more daunting and complicated than I probably should have taken on but it was it was a seahorse dragon and it was all in green stuff which you know I've talked about that I, I'm comfortable with green stuff now it's fine but it's not my favorite sculpting material to do entire figures with and I was still had a lot to learn and it was a struggle. Um, but I got it done and it turned out pretty good in, in my opinion for especially for it being my very first commission It was technically my third sculpt ever as well um, So yeah, I'll uh, I plan on showing it off. I'm gonna do a series uh, an episode for the mini sculpting super show event uh, in the next couple months where I show off kind of my progression of sculpting and uh, that will be one of the first ones you see all right, this one's from Logo Bean. Tom, love your videos. Two questions. I know in past videos you built your armature using wire and green stuff, and now I see you have moved to soldering the wires. Part one, which one do you prefer more? Two, do you have a video on how to solder armatures? Keep up the good work. All right, so yeah, I, I haven't completely moved away from doing green stuff armatures, um, but I do like uh, the soldering a lot. I, I need some more practice, and I will be doing a video, um, but like I said, just wanna 
want to kind of get down the technique a little better before I teach people. Um, which do I prefer? Well, right now it's still easier for me to do the putty version and quicker. Um, but I, I can tell that once I get better, the right tools for soldering, which seems to be the key, um, the soldering iron I have right now is pretty old and, and um, beat up. And so if I can get one that'll get the temp a little better and has a non-damaged nose, I think it will go better. And uh, yeah, but they're both good. They're both viable. I would do whichever one. The putty one's good because you don't need anything else to do it. So there you go. Okay. Ooh, here's another name. Let's see. Ladislav Simon. Can you bake it safely? if you use soldered armature. Yes, you can bake it safely. The uh, solder melts at a much higher temperature than it uh, takes to bake your miniature, if you're using Fimo, or even to vulcanize it. So you're totally fine, totally safe. Don't worry about it. And this next question is from Dreadnought. Tom, could you talk a little about the process of sculpting multiple miniatures, which are supposed to be more or less uniform, have uniform elements, for instance, the minis, in a particular Mercs faction. Um, yeah, so Mercs, this was actually something that we kind of, it was good and bad, but we kind of went back and forth on how to how best to handle it because we wanted all the Mercs guys to have character, so some unique characters, so they, we actually didn't keep elements as common as maybe we could have or should have. Um, so that was always a struggle. But then, you know, we did uh, some other factions where they did share elements. But um, to answer your question, for sculpting, uh, so it's really good if you can, if you have some very key elements like, for instance, weapons and helmets are, are really good things because they're very easy. Well, one, you want them to look very consistent. And two, they're very easy to just pop on the figure. Um, if you're going to do stuff like have a, a, a stock sculpted torso or um, maybe eh, shoulder pads you could maybe get away with but but things on the torso or on the limbs they tend to be a little tougher to use as stock elements and, and the reason for that is because they they get in the way of posing interesting and and dynamic and unique things because if you have it statically done you're always it's gonna be very hard to get push past that static element. Um, you, you might not realize this, but when you sculpt a guy, even a space marine space, in a space suit or whatever, um, even when it's got rigid armor plates and all this stuff, if you're sculpting him in a, in a twisted, dynamic, sword swinging pose, you, will, you might make slight manipulations to the armor that are technically wrong or technically different, but still look right. And when you've got a stock torso done, you can't do that. It's going to be what it is and, and it's hard to get that little stuff. So another technique would be to um, sculpt a few stock bodies where most of the elements are done, like maybe even just two stock bodies in different poses, and then you can add on elements from there later. Uh, again, I plan on doing a, uh, uh, an episode on this very thing um, down the road, so keep an eye out. All right, and our last question is, is from Camp Barrage or Farage again. So, how do you do fiddly things like nails and large flat things like feathery tails or a cape flowing behind someone? Oh, well, that's a, those are a lot of different things. Um, so I'll answer them quickly just to get it out and then maybe I will, I'll probably have to do some tutorials on these to really get into it. But nails are done with small tools, small sharp tools like a scalpel or exacto blade and maybe a needle. You just basically cut in the shape. If you want it to be something longer, maybe like a claw, then you can actually use a putty element and form that rather than just cutting it in. But if you know it's going to be a regular fingernail, you can usually just cut it in. But I usually don't worry about it on um, the 28 to 35 millimeter miniatures. I usually want to reserve that for bigger stuff. Large flat things like feathery tails, those can be tricky. You want to build a bit of an, ar an ar understructure or an extra armature, and that can be with some thin wires that you then putty over, or just make a thin layer of putty, let it cure, and then start putting or yeah, put putty or clay over that, 
and then start working in the details. But the key is, and this goes for capes a little bit too, is you have to have a bit of an understructure. Uh, with capes, it can be a little trickier, um, and I got into it a little bit with my cape tutorial I did uh, a few weeks back. But as you probably are aware, you know that cape wasn't really up and out and flowing. It was against the character and going down to the ground, so you didn't have to worry about that. Um, but a trick I used a while ago, because I don't like to put armatures in my capes, because that kind of um, keeps you, it kind of ties your hands from being able to make it flap and um, twist in interesting ways. But what I will do is I'll, I'll use very similar techniques to the video, and then I will make some wire armatures to, not armatures, I'll make wire supports that can go in and around underneath or around the capes and that and that just helps hold it up into place and helps uh, maintain certain folds while it's setting up into that wild outer flowing position all right well that was the last question this was a lot of fun thank you so much for everybody who uh put that in and we'll, i'll definitely do this again someday so that's it for today though i'll see you tomorrow